Welcome everyone. Uh, we'll be starting in just a few minutes uh, with Rob Larson and Terry Wycombe. Um, we're just um, letting a few minutes go by to get a few, let a few more people join us. But uh, we are going to start pretty much right on time because we have a lot of really interesting things to get through today in our hour. And so uh, I don't think we'll um, wait too much longer after the 12 noon time to start. So I'm glad you're with us. Welcome. It's going to be a really fun um, hour that we're looking forward to. I'm so excited. Um, with uh, Rob Larson and Terry Wycombe from Wyoming, our special guest. So uh, we'll be starting in just one more minute. So good afternoon. Good to see you. Oh, we're getting a lot of people joining in here. So uh, I'll start in just one minute because we've got a lot of people piling in here. And uh, we'll start in one minute. Uh, welcome everyone. Glad you can join us. We'll be starting momentarily in a few moments. Okay. And we got, okay, welcome, welcome. We're getting more people. Thank you. Good. Thank you for joining us. We're very excited. And uh, we'll just let a few join in while I'm talking. Okay. Well, let me start. Good afternoon. We are so glad that you joined us. Uh, Gallatin Valley Earth Day is really thrilled to present Wind Energy Basics. My name is Ann Reddy, and I'm the chair of Gallatin Valley Earth Day. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our speakers, Rob Larson and Mayor Terry Wycombe. But before we do that, I just wanted to remind you that you can watch the most inspiring and charming film, 2040, at your convenience anytime now through Sunday, April 18th. And you can get the link um, for the movie on our website, which is www.gallatinvalleyearthday.org. And these details are also in the program that you can download if you look on the right side of your screen, uh, partway down, about almost halfway down, you'll see a little handout. Um, line and right below that it says Gallatin Valley Earth Day program and that lists all the events, um, over 20 events that will be going on for Earth Day month here. So uh, I wanted to get back to our 2040 film and just um, thank, we have a number of businesses in town. This movie is free for you to watch because of their generous support. Um, a shout out to Hope Lutheran's Creation Care Team, uh, Happy Trash Can, Bozeman Farmer's Market, Tree Line Coffee and Hebe's Grocery. And uh, if you pull up that program, you'll see a lot of other events, including next Saturday. Hopefully you won't miss it. If you're in town here in Bozeman on Saturday, April 17th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Bozeman Public Library is our festival with music and food and exhibits and kids activities. So don't miss that. And lastly, before we get started here, I just wanted to thank our major sponsors who um, have supported over 20 Earth Day events this year, and they are Oboe Footwear, Wrestler Motors, the Greater Gallatin United Way, and of course, Sacagawea Audubon Society. Um, I want to give a special thanks to Sacagawea Audubon Society because they're providing our platform for today's talk. So um, now without further ado, as they say, I'm very pleased to introduce Rob Larson. So if we can bring Rob onto our screen here, I'll just uh, give you a little intro. He is an associate professor in mechanical and industrial engineering department at Montana State University. And his research and interests include wind energy, renewable energy technologies, and also snow and avalanche science, composite materials, and instrumentation. Now, Rob serves as the director of Montana State's Wind and Renewable Center, and he has taught um, wind and renewable energy courses at MSU for the past 14 years. So welcome, Rob. We are so glad you joined us today uh, to give us a basic understanding of uh, wind energy and its potential mm -hmm. for energy production in Montana. Um, before um, he starts his talk, I just wanted to let our audience members know 
that during the talk, if you have questions that you want to ask Rob, if you look over on the right hand column of your screen, in gray, there's a little, uh, there's a line that says questions. If you click on that button, you'll be able to type in your questions. And then once Rob gets done, I will read out the questions and he can answer them. So take it away, Rob. And uh, we look forward to your talk. Thanks. Well, thank you, Ann. Um, let me show my screen here and see if that uh, function works. All right, I believe I believe we're there. All right, so I'll preface my um, my talk with uh, maybe an apology. I I plan to go pretty quickly, um, and starting from basics um, is the idea here. So I'll do just that. Uh, I'll have to enter my professor mode and and try to whip through this material, and hopefully you all find something uh, useful and interesting. And for those who don't, there are some pretty pictures as well. So um, with that, uh, here's my list of discussion topics that I hope to hit today. First, a little bit of wind history. Uh, I'll talk about the wind resource, um, power, and some energy basics. I'll talk a little bit about turbine designs, mostly an overview level uh, look at that. Some of the drivers for wind energy, why are we uh, pushing this or why is it uh, becoming more and more uh, common? And also some of the challenges for wind energy. Um, importantly, uh, what this discussion uh, does not include is um, electrical system design. Um, not only am I a mechanical engineer, not an electrical engineer, uh, but the discussions get fairly complex and um, probably beyond the time frame of this chat. Um, I will not talk much about blade design, complex modeling, permitting, legal issues, and probably a million other details that need to be left out due to the uh, short timeline. <clears throat> With that, let's talk about some windmill history. Uh, wind machines have been in use for thousands of years. Uh, they were in use in Persia um, as early as 200 BC. Uh, there were vertical axis cloth covered windmills in Afghanistan uh, used to grind corn and pump water as early as the seventh century. In the 14th century, uh, Dutch windmills were used to drain areas of the Rhine River Delta um, by 1900 in Denmark, there were 2,500 windmills uh, working uh, for uh, mechanical loads um, used as pumps and mills, producing the equivalent of about 30 megawatts. So we'll get uh, deep into the terminology here soon, uh, so some of these uh, discussion points make more sense. The modern day turbine really started off in the 1980s. Uh, with implementation of large numbers of small term, turbines in California uh, near Palm Springs and near Altamont Pass. And as you can see from this chart, uh, the size range uh, has increased uh, throughout. Um, uh, evolution of wind turbines involve growth in scale, height, output, uh, rotor diameter, and cost. Uh, some of the largest turbines these days are up to 300 meters uh, height of the rotor. So think of three football fields um, stretching into the sky. Um, the, the scale of these things is really quite immense. But before I go much further into turbines, uh, since wind turbines extract energy from the wind resource, let's take a look at that resource. So wind. Um, it's said that about one quarter of a percent of incident sunlight is converted to wind energy. Uh, the available power amounts to about one watt per meter squared over the Earth's surface. That excludes the high altitude winds and the jet stream uh, type winds. This is just the relatively low altitude winds that might be tapped into by a wind energy system. Uh, global resource estimates from 30 to 300 terawatts. Um, if we take that, um, that power unit of terawatts and multiply it by the number of hours in a year, we get up to 2.6 exawatts or 10 to the 18th watt hours per year. Um, for those of you who uh, are unfamiliar with these prefixes, uh, there's a quick table uh, to refresh your memory from seventh grade science class when we first introduced some of these terms, uh, 10 to the 18 watt hours per year is a gigantic number. 
Um, the accompanying photo shows uh, the Earth's energy budget, uh, largely driven by incoming solar energy, which a quarter percent is converted to wind. Um, it's said that there's far more wind energy available in the wind resource than needed to supply global electrical demand. Um, in the U.S., um, global uh, U.S. demand is something around 4 million gigawatt hours or 10 to the ninth watt hours per year. Um, in the world uh, scale, it's something like 25 million um, gigawatt hours per year. Um, with this slide and many, I list some of the sources of data, information, and imagery along the bottom. So wind. Uh, wind is driven by global forces, uneven surface heating from the sun, the Coriolis effect, which is what happens when the earth spins and there's uh, a moving um, air, which has mass. Uh, it tends to bend and twist. And then the pressure systems created uh, by weather events uh, move this air around. Uh, we're all familiar with various types of wind uh, regimes from sea and land breezes, uh, daytime and nighttime breezes, often driven by surface heating or cooling. And there are a lot of other effects of, uh, of uh, wind on wind, including orographic or surface contour influences, for instance, funneling through a gap. Um, ridgetop winds um, are common and often create turbulence in the lee of ridges. For you Bridger Bowl skiers, you may be uh, familiar with those accelerated winds on top of the ridge at Bridger, and pilots try to avoid avoid turbulence downstream of mountain ranges. Um, I'm sorry, I have a sensitive mouse here on my machine. Um, all these influence really uh, relate to significant variability of the wind resource. It's highly variable by location. Um, the National Re Renewable Energy Lab is one of the U.S. Department of Energy's labs that uh, creates wind maps, and they show uh, that in the U.S., which has, by the way, one of the world's top wind resources, uh, strong resources in sort of the central wind belt, wind belt. And Montana has a great wind resource, around fifth best among U.S. states. Uh, these maps were created at an elevation of 80 meters through uh, modeling and uh, anemometer data. Um, a more recent map has been released that shows 100 meter uh, wind speeds. Um, why the new map? Well, newer, larger turbines need data at greater heights. Another feature of this map uh, is the offshore wind potential, which is quite excellent uh, in the U.S. Um, wind speed obviously varies by location. So whenever you see a graph like this, a statistical distribution, you know that that means variability. This is a Raleigh or Weibel distribution uh, that is used to characterize uh, wind speeds at a given location. Um, Beyond the variability we've discussed, there's variability over different time scales. Uh, in the upper right is a quick graph showing um, some mean uh, monthly wind speeds from our neighbors to the north in Lethbridge. Um, and it shows that um, some years are simply windier than others. Uh, wind varies by season. Um, some seasons, as shown in the lower chart, are uh, relatively less windy and relatively more stable. Uh, wind speed varies by day to day as storms come and go. It varies by the hour, uh, by the minute, and even by the second. There's additional variability in the wind resource um, uh, by direction, uh, as shown in these wind road, wind rose graphs. Uh, these from Rainsford, Montana, showing uh, frequency of wind speed by dis by direction. Okay, and there's even more variability. And this is an important one. Wind speed varies with height. Uh, that, that variation of wind speed with height is called wind shear. And wind shear depends on the relative surface roughness um, encountered. Um, wind speeds over a uh, low roughness surface like water or open fields uh, show a relatively um, uniform wind speed distribution all the way to near the ground, whereas if large surface roughness elements are present, like forests, ridges, tall buildings and cities, uh, we get a very uneven and gradual increase of wind speed with height. So what's the point of all this wind discussion? 
All this moving air has kinetic energy. There's a formula for kinetic energy there, and I will try not to bore you too much with formulas. Um, but uh, if we take that energy term, power is the rate that energy becomes available. So if we divide out that time term, wind power can be calculated from a simple equation. Power equals one half rho a v cubed. Um, that equation shows that wind power is directly related to air density, directly related to cross-sectional area, but related to the cube of the wind speed, of the wind velocity. So looking at each of these variables um, regarding density, that first term, density decreases with elevation. So a turbine installed in Montana at let's say an elevation of 5,000 feet will have lower performance than a turbine installed at sea level. The area considerations are also something worth uh, discussing. That second term for a circular rotor and virtually all wind uh, machines are at circular rotors. Area is pi r squared, so power varies with the square of the diameter or the radius if you choose. All things equal, a larger term at turbine will always produce more power uh, because it taps into more of that wind resource. Uh, finally, the third variable, velocity. Uh, this is uh, the dominant factor. If we double wind velocity while keeping everything else the same, we'll have eight times more energy. So the best commercial wind power plant sites are those in areas with strong, consistent, non-turbulent winds. How do we get all this data? Well, data sources include maps for general use. Uh, you can contract a service to model data to get fine details. Um, you can install a meteorological tower, a MET tower at a proposed site, um, but those only go up to about 80 meters. Um, new inventions like SODAR, sound detection and ranging, and LIDAR, uh, laser infrared detection and ranging, can increase that range up and beyond the height of modern turbines and are becoming more and more popular. Um, the layouts of wind energy facilities are strongly influenced by measurement of this wind resource, so it's important to get good data. All right, so, so far I've been talking about uh, power in the wind, but how about extracting all this power? As it turns out, only a part of this power is available to extract. Um, the so-called BETS limit defines the best wind turbine performance theoretically possible. Uh, this was uh, derived by uh, German physicist Albert Betz, and he calculated the Betz limit to be 59.3%. Um, all turbine designs perform below the Betz limit. So the best performance uh, to date is only about three quarters of the Betz limit, meaning that only about 45% of the power in the wind stream can be tapped into. Um, for you math fans, uh, I invite you to derive the Betts limit in your free time. Uh, just remember that Albert Betts did it in 1919 and he didn't have a computer or a calculator. Um, in layman's terms, what the Betts limit says is that if a wind turbine was 100% efficient, all the wind would have to stop as it hit the turbine. And in order to stop that wind, the air doesn't get out of the way. No more air could come in and the turbine wouldn't spin anymore. So, how about machines to tap into this resource? Wind turbine uh, design. Um, there's two primary varieties or classes, categories of wind turbines. The hot horizontal axis wind turbine and the VOT, the vertical axis wind turbine. The hot turbine is the most common um, turbine. Um, essentially, all commercial wind energy production worldwide over 23,000 commercial turbines uh, use this configuration, an upwind facing three blade machine. Um, vertical axis wind turbines are interesting, both the Darius or lift force type and the Savonius drag force type, but there are no successful commercial installations that I'm aware of to date. Small scale and uh, large scale units uh, can be found. Some small scale um, horizontal axis wind turbine designs include a Bergy and a Skystream. And there's some other small scale uh, vertical axis designs, the Windspire, Fire Revolution, and others exist. Uh, industrial scale hot designs, the ones we're familiar on our cross country travels, would include Intercons E126. The 126 refers to the rotor diameter in meters. 
with Estes V100, 100 meter rotor diameter, and the ubiquitous General Electric 1.5. Uh, that has a 70.5 meter rotor diameter, relatively small uh, for modern turbines, uh, but these are uh, the kind seen at Judith Gap uh, Wind Energy Facility, um, run by Invenergy and in other uh, locations. How big will these things get? Well, the current leaders of this ongoing size race are Siemens uh, um, and GE's uh, competing 14 megawatt turbines. Um, these are uh, so big that they're designed mostly for offshore installations due to the difficulty in transport on land, uh, but they're immense. At the U.S. average household electricity consumption rate of 10,400 kilowatt hours per year, each one of these 14 megawatt turbines could supply all the electricity needed by 12,000 homes for a year. And these are being installed in large arrays of turbines, making a huge contribution to the world's uh, electrical energy production. Um, all these horizontal axis commercial wind turbines rely on um, high ratio of blade lift to drag. But again, getting into the details of performance of blade design is probably beyond the scope of this. So I'll move on. Other wind turbine subsystems uh, include the foundation, uh, the tower, um, the cell where all the machinery is housed, the hub and rotor uh, that spins, and then the drivetrain, uh, including gearboxes and generators in most cases, although some uh, direct drive uh, turbines are becoming quite popular. Also, the electronics and controls for yaw, turning into or away from the wind, pitch, changing the blade angle with respect to the wind, braking, power electronics, which is the purpose after all of the uh, wind turbine, along with cooling and other diagnostic bits. Lots of things going on in a wind turbine. Um, there are different varieties of wind turbines for different climates. Um, recent experiences in Texas with loss of some of their wind turbine uh, capacity uh, led me to include this slide. Um, for the turbine, uh, about the only change is ice detection and possibly mitigation like heaters in the blades. Um, but for operations and for the operators, they'd have to adapt for, to climate demands. Um, it, there are many uh, installations of wind turbines um, near and beyond the Arctic Circle. So uh, clearly turbines can effectively operate in all weather regimes. Um, other components of turbines would include the foundation in various uh, uh, forms, uh, towers evolving from early truss structures to more modern monopole designs, and so forth. Um, interestingly, as wind energy moves offshore, uh, different uh, configurations have been proposed and all manner of different uh, configurations will likely be implemented from uh, floating towers and towers in floating arrays, um, et cetera. Various uh, uh, loads influence these wind turbine designs from aero forces of lift and drag, gravity load because of the mass of the turbine structure. There's some dynamic interactions that need to be accounted for, like turning uh, uh, rotor while yawing the um, machine to face in a different direction. There are control loads such as starting and stopping and the obviously uh, obvious electrical loads. Those loads can be steady, cyclic, predictable or random, short or long duration and so forth. Uh, this graphic is a little bit interesting. It shows that wind shear, change of wind speed with elevation um, and a superimposed sort of uh, um, gusting um, uh, turbulence effect and as the wind turbine rotates through that wind regime, there will be all kind of uh, loads imparted to the turbine. Um, this sort of graphic helps, un helps people understand why the three-bladed design has become so popular. It naturally balances the wind shear loads better than other blade counts, which might impart sort of a wobble and high bearing loads to these massive components. Uh, fabricating all these components is big business and quite the exercise. Um, fabrication of wind turbine blades is almost entirely done with composite materials, fiberglass cloth in large molds uh, with um, 
uh, pressurized uh, epoxy resin injected into those molds. And you can see some of the um, scale from the individuals working on these blades. Um, once fabricated, uh, representative blades undergo static and dynamic testing to ensure reliability. Uh, this shot from a National Renewable Energy Labs test site. But even rigorous testing can't prevent occasional problems. Here's some shots I took at one of Montana's wind farms uh, with uh, damage to wind turbines caused by uh, lightning strikes, um, causing burns and uh, failure of the blades. Um, I've been talking quite a lot, uh, not defining many terms. So here's a few definitions. Um, system availability is one definition worth noting that is defined as the percentage of time a system is available to produce energy. Capacity factor is another one. The percentage of energy actually produced compared to what would be produced at the nameplate rating, and then the power curve of a turbine. Right. So um, why the big push for wind? Well, there's a number of drivers for uh, wind energy. One of the biggest ones is that uh, wind power has seen increased efficiency and, uh, and as a result, declining wind energy costs. Uh, there have been federal and state policies in place and still ongoing that um, uh, promote, in many cases, wind development. There are economic development opportunities um, surrounding wind energy. Um, the public generally supports clean, green energy. There's the concept of energy security, where homegrown, non-imported energy is uh, more secure. And then there's the uh, elephant in the room, climate change and carbon risk. Regarding some of the uh, costs and uh, generation increases, uh, this chart uh, is pretty instructive and shows that since about 2000, uh, the percentage of uh, total U.S. electrical energy generation from wind has gone from essentially zero to about eight and a half percent. Right now, we're at about 350 billion kilowatt hours in the U.S., and these numbers keep going up. Uh, turbines are becoming more efficient. Uh, that capacity factor that we just defined, um, which defines what percentage of the rated capacity of a wind turbine or wind farm might be realized, uh, went up to 41% for facilities uh, that have been recently installed, up to five years old. The earlier generation was only 31%, and the first turbines in this modern age were only about 25% capacity factor. So we're tapping more efficiently into that wind resource. Uh, turbines continue to get bigger. Um, average swept area, that A term in our equation, has doubled since 2010. The output rating has increased by 42%, and the height of these turbines at the hub has gone up by 13%. Again, tapping into that wind resource. Uh, turbines are getting cheaper. Uh, prices have fallen. It's about $700 to $850 uh, per kilowatt of rated uh, capacity. All these things lead to wind power getting cheaper. Uh, the power purchasing agreements, or uh, PPA, average prices that utilities uh, make a deal with wind energy providers are below two cents a kilowatt hour. That's below the projected future fuel costs of gas fired generation and well below uh, coal. So wind, um, despite all the environmental effects and so forth, has really come onto its own due to an economics argument. Wind is cheap. The levelized cost of wind energy without federal production tax credits is one third what it was only 10 years ago. Regarding those, uh, those federal uh, benefits, legislation helps drive implementation. Renewable portfolio standards are an example. Uh, these are uh, re renewable and clean standards implemented state by state. There's no federal RPS. These are only by state. But for instance, Montana required uh, that by the year 2015, 15% of uh, power um, must be derived from renewable sources. Um, Montana has met and, and uh, remains uh, within um, uh, compliance of that state uh, requirement. Other states have far more aggressive renewable portfolio standards. California, Washington, Colorado, uh, New Mexico, New York, and others all have uh, standards 
that will phase in 100% of energy must come from renewable sources uh, by various years. The year 2040 and 2045 would be a typical um, uh, goal line. Um, 30 states plus the District of Columbia have these renewable portfolio standards. Um, federal um, production tax credits and investment tax credits help the wind world. I consider these training wheels for the burgeoning industry. And they're about ready to come off, but they are still in place. Production tax credits give uh, producers about one to two cents per kilowatt hour uh, for the first 10 years, or producers could select the investment tax credit that gives 12 to 30 percent of the investment at project start. Uh, those are good for um, high upfront cost installations. The PTC has just been extended this past December for another year and um, established uh, Congress has established a 30% investment tax credit for offshore wind projects that are now the big push at the federal level. I mentioned earlier that one of the drivers is economic development, and maybe these two graphs or, or images uh, tell the tale. Um, on the left is a wind map of the United States showing the, the wind belt in the center. On the right is the geographic distribution of depopulation, which almost exactly matches the windiest areas. Um, if economic development uh, were to be incentivized in these areas, it could be a boon for uh, the economies of those regions. Um, economic development impacts uh, are well characterized. Several studies through National Renewal, Renewable Energy Labs and others uh, include things like land lease payments for use of private properties to install wind farms, there's property tax revenues, there are jobs during and after construction, and local industries can benefit. Uh, the benefits are really compounded. Um, this document um, is an example of what may happen if Montana is so built out in wind development where all five thousand megawatts of development potential are realized. That may be unlikely, but the numbers are somewhat impressive. Here are some actual impacts, and this from a document um, compiled here at Montana State University uh, showing the various economic impacts from individual um, wind projects in various areas throughout the state. Uh, numerous con construction jobs and permanent jobs, capital investments in the millions, um, and these numbers are representative of wind uh, installations um, nationwide. Uh, from a nationwide perspective, this document shows various regions. Montana is primarily lying in the uh, WEC region, uh, the Western Exchange, and by 2030, the economic impacts uh, from wind development are predicted to approach $80 billion. Other benefits from wind energy on the pro side include environmental benefits, uh, no sulfur or nitrous oxides emitted by wind energy uh, installations. There are no particulates or no mercury compounds emitted, no carbon dioxide is emitted, no water used, which is a big deal in arid uh, places like the West. On the CO2 front, um, things get a little more sobering. Uh, the need to address global CO2 levels uh, really is reaching an emergency type of status. I just pulled some of these results. Um, here's the December 15th, 2020 carbon dioxide concentration at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing. For a longer range perspective, one can look at um, ice cores dating back um, uh, thousands of years. Um, and adding the Mauna Loa data after 1958. And I pulled this data last night, 419 parts per million of carbon dioxide, where the long-term uh, global average over thousands of years was somewhere in the 275 range. Now this has implications for climate um, uh, issues such as uh, global climate change um, that probably should be addressed sooner rather than later. Wind energy is one way to do that. Uh, this chart shows cumulative carbon savings up through the year 2030. The 
left axis label, MMTCE, is millions of metric tons of carbon equivalent. So that's a mouthful. Uh, but the, the trend is good. If wind energy um, is used in lieu of uh, carbon-based energy sources, there is a drastic decrease in emissions of carbon. So obviously there's many pros with wind. How about the flip side? Um, the challenges for wind power uh, are plentiful and include transmission, um, transmission capacity, federal rules on transmission, access to lines, installation of new lines. There's the siting and permitting question. Um, birds, bats, noise, visual effects, land usage questions. There's accounting for the um, non-monetary benefits. Let's say uh, the um, lack of emission of carbon. Um, and then there's also policy uncertainty at the federal, state, and local levels. As administrations change, policies change, that these systems must be in place for uh, decades and uh, planning becomes problematic. On the transmission front, transmission lines are needed to move and export power. Uh, Montana remains an energy exporter. Um, we produce more than we use, um, and until electricity storage uh, comes into its own, it is presently still in its infancy, uh, Montana electricity must be used as generated, and that means that it has to be brought to distant load sources. Um, there's issues uh, to adding transmission capacity. There's environmental issues, visual issues, land usage, cost. There have been some power lines built recently, but others declined. The Mountain State's inner tie line uh, would have uh, transferred electricity from Montana through Idaho. Uh, was not built due, due to environmental and uh, land usage concerns. Um, there is a line called the Montana-Alberta tie line that uh, runs north into Canada, bringing Montana energy to Canada, but there were challenges to that installation due to eminent domain and land usage, right? Uh, declaration that private property must be used for this public good, but the public good was for Canada. So there's all these kinds of issues, right? Um, not to mention that Montana wind has to be carried for hundreds or thousands of miles um, through windy states like Wyoming, North Dakota, um, even Washington to reach load centers where there's a market for this energy. Um, partially due to some of these challenges, Montana has about 900 megawatts of installed power. There's 550 commercial scale turbines installed in Montana. Um, in contrast, Texas, the leader in um, U.S. state energy uh, from wind um, spent seven billion dollars on transmission infrastructure and now has over 25,000 megawatts installed. Well, one single Texas wind farm has over 600 turbines, more than the entire count in the state of Montana. Of course, Texas has a different situation with a large population, a heavily industrialized base, a port city, and um, lots of uh, load centers locally. Uh, to serve um, as destinations for developed uh, wind energy. Other issues might in, uh, include wind turbine noise. Um, if you're too close to a wind turbine, you're going to hear it. This becomes a sighting challenge. Um, another similar sighting challenge is the visual effects with sight lines and clutter. The don't put thing in my backyard type of uh, discussion happens often with regard to wind. We hear it with offshore wind developments off the eastern seaboard, and the image in that slide shows uh, the perspective as wind turbine moves further and further offshore. But some of the early turbines were frank, or turbine installations, frankly, were an eyesore. Uh, numerous small uh, truss structure turbines in California um, uh, were problematic. Um, in a U.S. Uh, energy study uh, on land use, um, hydropower occupies um, the largest acreage per megawatt produced, but wind is up there too, 70.6 um, acres per megawatt on average. Of course, that doesn't preclude other uses for the land, like grazing and ranching, uh, farming, uh, but nonetheless, 
uh, there's a land use impact. Um, the question about birds always comes up. What about birds? Um, this is a factor. Um, bird strikes are a real thing and it is um, disturbing. Um, bird mortality instances are well documented. Um, bird counts uh, are required um, by uh, various agencies. Um, this particular study uh, showed the prevalence of bird strikes at numerous wind installations, including Judith Gap that I've highlighted here. Um, this study showed that uh, 405 birds were killed per year at the Judith Gap uh, wind farm in Montana. Um, these are estimates based on ground research after the fact, so no one knows for sure if these are perfectly accurate, but that's a significant number. Perhaps more important is the number of endangered species. Uh, let's consider raptors. The same study showed that there were 14 raptor deaths in the course of a year. Um, there are ways to mitigate these problems. Proper site selection is probably the biggest one. Uh, due diligence uh, before installations are done to identify flight corridors, local populations, uh, repowering or replacing older turbines with new models can help. Curtailment or shutting down turbines during migration may help, and deterrence are possible, like hazing. Um, I won't go into much depth here, but I wanted to include this slide because in 2013, in the state of Wyoming, Duke Energy was fined a million dollars for the death of 14 golden eagles, 160 birds total. They implemented a $600,000 a year radar detection system that turned off turbines as birds approached. Um, to put things in perspective, this study from 2002 characterized the source of bird fatalities. For every 10,000, building as in windows took the lion's share, cats took another thousand, um, high tension power lines, something like 800, uh, vehicle strikes, 700, pesticides, about the same. Uh, wind turbines took one out of one bird out of 10,000 fatalities. So that's an important sort of perspective issue, but I don't want to minimize the challenge of dealing with uh, birds. Bats are also an issue and bat mortality is well studied and a large concern in wind energy. There's other environmental concerns, um, sage grouse and other species, uh, not just birds, but mammals. There's land use issues, there's life cycle analysis and recycling, but these are probably too complex and I'm running low on time anyway. Many efforts are in work to address and resolve various uh, environmental and siting issues. For example, um, there's numerous databases and shared sites um, dedicated to resolving these types of issues. Uh, perhaps the largest challenge with wind is in integrating this variable resource into an energy distribution system based on reliability. Um, we all want the power to come on when we, uh, when we plug in. We want the lights to come on when we flip that switch. This graph shows um, a Midwestern wind plant uh, with uh, power output and wind speeds dropping from a um, sig significant amount, 80 megawatts, down to only 10 megawatts in just a few minutes. So this sort of variation is possible with the passage of weather fronts. Uh, these challenges are significant but being addressed now primarily with storage uh, coming on. So to wrap it up, uh, what about the future? Well, if I was a betting person, I would bet that turbines will keep growing larger. Um, offshore development will accelerate. Um, onshore will likely slow. Um, as our wind fleet ages, really the major uh, wind uh, installations are only 20 to 30 years old. As those age, they'll require more maintenance and replacement. Uh, new technologies will come along and uh, challenge conventional wind. There'll be more investments in storage, transmission, smart grid. In fact, we're seeing some proposed investments in national infrastructure right now from the present administration. We'll see where that goes. Uh, technology will continue to improve and someday natural renewable energy sources will be looked at as conventional once again. Um, a longer odds, I'm not quite ready to place the bet, but I have my fingers crossed, uh, would be that humans agree on the global impacts of fossil fuel use and adopt a broad portfolio, including energy alternatives in time to prevent uh, disaster. So um, thanks for your time. 
And I think Anne uh, might have a couple of questions before we turn it over to Terry. Yeah, thank you so much, Rob. That was so interesting. I have to say you covered so many topics so thoroughly that actually right now I don't see any questions coming in. So I think I'm just going to move ahead and uh, you can all, all of you who are out there, you can always go and uh, send us some questions and, and we can get your answers back from Rob. But I think we'll move along. Um, Lorene, did you see any other uh, hands up or anything? No? Um, no, but we do have a couple of questions. Oh, we do? Okay. I, for some reason, they're not showing up in my feed. I don't have anything listed. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm, wait I had oh, a... Rob, could you comment on this current state of the storage technology for wind energy to, a le to level out the uh, variabilities? Um, I'll just briefly, uh, there's a few things going on. Uh, one, a local company here in Bozeman, Absaroka Energy is uh, working on development of a pumps, pumped hydro storage facility uh, over near Martinsdale. It's called the Gordon Butte facility. Uh, so that would be a plus or minus 400 megawatt storage system using water uh, elevation as the battery. Basically take excess energy, pump it up to higher elevation uh, during uh, excess uh, power production. And then when it's needed, they could run it back down through generators and and, uh, and generate power so that will accept or provide up to 400 megawatts. So that's a great technology. And in fact, most of the world's storage is pumped hydro by using pretty much conventional. Very good. Batteries are also coming on uh, strong. You'll read about that in almost every newspaper. Uh, check out what Elon Musk is doing these days. Okay. Well, I hate to cut this short because it's so interesting, but I really want to get Terry uh, have enough um, time for people to ask Terry questions too. So, uh, without further ado, I think I'll just introduce Terry. If if we can switch on uh, Terry's uh, Terry's camera, then we'll uh, I'll introduce him here. So while we're getting Terry's camera on, I just wanted to tell you a little about Terry. Um, we're very honored to have him with us today. Um, since his interview in the New York Times last month, I think he's been in very high demand from journalists all around the world. Uh, so we're very happy you're with us. Thank you, Terry. Um, Terry is the mayor of Rollins, Wyoming, which is a town of just over 9,000 people in southern Wyoming in Carbon County, where he has lived for over four decades. And uh, he was appointed chairman of the Wind Task Force Committee for the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. And he was the chairman of the Carbon County Commissioners when they decided to bring a wind farm to Carbon County. So welcome, Terry. Um, glad you're with us. And, well, thank uh, you for having me. Yeah, I'm just going to um, start out with one question. And then I'm sure as the questions pour in, um, Lorene can help me with uh, fielding those. Um, uh, I just want to set the background. I know that I've heard that Rollins is really one of the most beautiful places in the world in the summertime. The people are warm, friendly. It's a great place to live. But um, needless to say, um, in the recent past here, the population has um, split in half, become half of what it was with the decline of the coal industry. So I wanted to, um, before we brought the wind farms to Rollins, I wanted to have you maybe just share with us a little background of of what your town was struggling with? Well, I moved here in 1978, and at that time we had 2,700 coal miners working about 40 miles from Rollins. They lived in, a, in several different towns, and then we had uh, the oil and gas industry was quite robust also. So we had all of those workers, and when I moved to town, it was very hard to even find a place to live. Uh, the, um, the town, uh, in the early 80s, of course, when the coal mines started closing, it, it was very tough on a lot of towns. We were not as uh, badly hit as, say, Hannah or Medicine Bow, but we are along the interstate and uh, uh, very, very much in the extraction business. Uh, railroad is one of the reasons Rollins is here. And uh, um, it has changed quite a little bit. And I'm not sure. Uh, does that answer your question? 
Yeah, that that's great. It gives us a little feel for uh, what your town has been facing. So I know that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, when you were a commissioner, um, you decided to bring in a wind farm project that um, I read, at least it's going to be one of the largest um, wind farms in the country with as many as a thousand wind turbines that would power a million homes. Um, I know um, that, as you said, that this, your area, Carbon County, is um, a coal country. So I'm just very curious um, if you can explain um, what your thinking process was in considering wind and, and why you wanted to bring it in. Well, it wasn't like we went out and found these people and brought them here. I would love to take credit for that, but that isn't the way it went. Uh, at one point in time, we had, because of our robust wind, we have an incredible wind. We're, we're 10 miles from the Continental Divide, which is one of the lowest places in the Continental Divide. So, of course, we're the wind tunnel. Wind averages 24 miles an hour in Rollins, Wyoming. And, and all of a sudden, there were uh, 53 wind farms scoping to come to Carbon County. They were going through the BLM and and they were looking and it, and it scared us. Uh, it scared us. We were being inundated with them. And um, and then things like the sage grouse uh, problem came along and, and there was a sage grouse core area designated and that relieved us of some problems. But I'll tell you, at first we were considering a, a moratorium on wind farms because there were, they were coming. The worst fear in the world is the fear of the unknown. We didn't know what to think about them. Um, however, we did know that they were going to be new to us, but they were not new to the world. And so we went out and investigated and tried to find out as much as we possibly could about wind farms. During that time, we realized there's places they should be and there's places they should not be. And because tourism is our second largest industry in Wyoming, I mean, very far down from extraction businesses, you know, the fossil fuels, but still it's our second industry. Uh, we did not want to have them in certain places. We worked very closely as commissioners with the uh, Bureau of Land Management to set aside certain places for uh, visual impacts. Um, and, uh, and that helped uh, a lot also. The other thing was, was uh, there was a tremendous difference in companies. Some of them came here as as takers. They just wanted to plunk down a farm, stay at home where they're at, and they didn't care if it impeded our views or made us miserable at all. Other companies went through a tremendous amount of research to look into things like uh, bird strikes and how to avoid those and, and uh, use of landfills. Uh, there were so many considerations. It was just incredible. Somewhere in there, we realized that this was this was a Carbon County problem, but a situation, but it was also a situation throughout Wyoming. So at that time, the County Commissioners Association appointed me to be the uh, chairman of the Wind Task Force Committee. And we looked at all of these things and we came up with some state minimum standards like how far do you want them from your county roads? How far do you want them from subdivisions? Um, you know, to keep their impacts down. There were all kinds of minimum standards uh, set for them, how much disturbance they could have at one time and such like that, not to cut, uh, not to cause dust problems. Um, anyway, we came up with minimum standards for statewide because the other reason was different counties had were, were rushing to make uh, their own set of rules to protect themselves. And some of those were contrary to others. And so we, we end up with wind farms that are in two different counties at the same time. So if you have uh, rules and regulations that are, are different, you could probably just end up in court about it. And so we didn't really want to stop industry. We just wanted to make sure that we were protected. So we came up with the minimum state standards and that helped a lot. Um, the other thing is, is it's just common sense. It was no, no, honestly on my part anyway, there was no thought of saving the earth by green energy or anything like that. I've always been a fan of, uh, uh, I've, I have a small wind tower myself I play with, but um, it's interesting to me to have, and it's just another industry that came. And they did it in such a way that it it uh, it was a good trade-off. You know, it would be no different as if you had a who knows a fireworks company come. 
and they were going to be far enough away from people not to be a bother to their neighbors and such like that, you would probably figure out some rules for them to go by and allow them to be. They have, um, there's only three counties in Wyoming that are, uh, have a, uh, I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit, but we're rushed for time, so I'll do it. Uh, there's only three counties in Wyoming that have a, their budget is in the black. Everybody else is in the red. Those three counties all have to do with wind farming. Um, they don't create a, a lot of jobs, but they do create a lot of taxes. So anyway, that's why we welcome, welcomed those folks to do business in our county. And I'm, I'm doing handstands. It's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I guess that explains why uh, the New York Times quoted you as saying, if it wasn't for wind farms, we'd be in terrible shape. Um, Lorene, yeah. um, I have another question I could ask, but um, I wanted to open it up with our few minutes left and see, do you have some questions there from our audience? Well, I'm um, not hearing you. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Right now, Terry, how much employment does the wind farms provide? You know, that's 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 where that that's the lacking part in wind farms. Okay, um, I already mentioned that we had 2,700 coal miners. It's going to take about 3,000 people, they say, to build this wind farm that has a thousand towers. It's a choke cherry Sierra, Sierra Madre project. It's going to take about 3,000 people, uh, three to five years, to build it. And then at the end of it, it's only going to take about 100 people to run it. But I would like to point out something that while they only have 100 people driving out there every day to work once it's up, those people will still be paying rent, buying food, filling their car with gas, creating other jobs. I fully expect the fact that we have a thousand towers already in Carbon County and we're about to have a thousand more, very possible that we'll get a wind tower service company and parts and those type of businesses following that business. So that's our hopes. One other thing that nobody talks about a lot is with the wind, what wind farms have brought to us that, that we wouldn't have any other way in these, are these uh, power lines that take electrons out of Carbon County to other parts of the world. Wind, as as uh, you just heard, it, it goes and then it doesn't go and there has to be a backup. You can't back up wind energy with coal because coal takes too long to turn on and turn off. But natural gas, you can turn it on and turn it off and run turbines. And so those power lines are not, not particular where those electrons came from. So by allowing the wind farms to come build those power lines or pipelines out of our state, we open ourselves up for way more, way more things like with natural gas and some other things like that. So, you know, it's a win-win. It's not whether we have wind or coal or whatever. I firmly believe we're, it's going to take it all. I don't have an electric car. If I did, I would have no way of charging it. Um, I wouldn't be able to drive anywhere. Our town is 100 miles from any place. I'm not going to shoot the horse I'm riding till I have another horse. Now, once all of this catches up, and I think maybe in my lifetime it might, but uh, it's it's a transitional period, and you know we can you can say whatever you want, but it's just going to take a while. Okay, we have a question here. Somebody's raised their hand. Patrick Miller. Patrick, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Hope it's a hard one. <laughs> well, he uh, he hasn't unmuted himself, but we have a couple other questions here. Are the local gas exploration and pr production people being brought uh, into the work on the wind turbine projects? Um, you know, it's it's kind of funny. The people that work in oil and gas continue to work there. And when we had our coal, uh, coal mines closed, a lot of people moved away. They wanted to stay mining. And so they moved to Gillette, they moved to Nevada, so forth. Uh, a lot of the local oil and uh, gas is uh, pretty steady right now. And I don't think it's going to go up or down. I think it's just going to stay kind of where it's at. We went through a tremendous boom where we had, oh gosh, 
five or 6,000 extra people in town that didn't live here. Some of them brought their families, some didn't. Yeah, you want to talk about change characteristic of a town, have, um, have that happen. Um, and I moved here in the middle of that. I came here like one of those. I was looking for a job and uh, quality of life begins with a paycheck. And so when you have jobs, people will come. This oil field thing, there's not a lot of people eager to switch over because it's not easy to switch over. You don't just quit being a coal miner and then go get on a wind tower. You have to go through an educational process. And to be quite honest with you, I don't think, uh, I don't think that's the missing component is what I'm trying to say. Getting people trained to, to quit pumping oil and go get 300 foot in the air and feel good about it. <laughs> and there's a last question here. Any tips on how to bring wind energy to your community if the wind energy uh, doesn't come to you? The, yeah, there really is. And that is, and I don't, every state has a different tax structure. We met, there were five states that met together in Denver one time. And uh, there were, like in Wyoming, you cannot forgive uh, property tax, which is the largest tax they pay. Um, but they're like in New Mexico and such, they had uh, industrial bonds where they went to the counties and to the schools and they asked them to forgive their share of the property tax. And that was to entice wind farms to come. There was a study done by Governor Friedenthal. It was an E3 study and it was comparing all the different tax schemes by all the states. It's almost impossible to do that. But what I would say is what we did was we welcomed them. If they were gonna come here, instead of trying to swat them like a bunch of flies, cause they were everywhere. Uh, my goal at any rate, and the people I worked with, fortunately, we were like, here they come and they are coming. So you can stand in the middle of the track and get run over, or you can stand at the switch and kind of decide where they're gonna be. So if they're coming, we tried to do every single thing we could do to make them successful. Some people are like, why aren't you harder on them? Why aren't you meaner to them? Why would I want an industry that's having a tough time come to my midst? You know, I, I, I wanted them to be successful. Why weren't they here 30 years ago? Well, because it wasn't economically viable. You just heard all about it. That was a really good presentation, by the way. And uh, sometimes when I talk to professors, I kind of like to argue with them. I, I don't want to argue with this guy. He's so right on. <laughs> Truth. Well, Lorene, um, is there one last question? I know we're sort of run out of time, um, or uh, should I wrap it up here? Well, um, are uh, the landowners being paid well for the use of their land? Would be the last oh, yeah. question. Yeah, they are. As a matter of fact, what, what I've noticed is a lot of the wind farms are no longer leasing from private ranchers. They buy the ranch. And mm -hmm. there's an upside and downside to that both. Um, I, I, I'm... I've been to Montana barely, you know, so I don't, I can't tell you what I know what people up there think. Up here, uh, the ranchers don't like wind farms. On the other hand, if they happen to be the ranch that's getting the contract to get the wind farms, they love wind farms. So, <laughs> yeah, it's all about the money. Yeah. Well, hey, that's a good place to to end. I think you've hit it, the nail on the head there, Terry. It is all about the money when it comes down to it. And I just wanted to express a great um, big thank you again for joining us. I just, uh, we're just so thrilled that you could take some time and, and be with us. And also wanted to thank Rob again for what a, what a wonderful presentation he gave. Um, we're all so lucky um, to have watched it today. For those um, we'll, who didn't make it, we will be sending a follow-up email and it will we will include a, a link to the recording so that you can watch it again or share it with other people who might be interested. Um, I really want to give a big thanks to our tech person, to Lorraine. Thank you behind the scenes for making everything run so smoothly. And Yes, uh, and I would like to say for those questions that we didn't have time to answer, there were quite a few for Rob. Um, I've sent them to Rob and hopefully we'll email you or send those in the email response. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, uh, I just wanted to wrap it up and I want to say 
to all of you, have a wonderful day. Thanks for coming. And we hope that you can join us for another Gallatin Valley Earth Day event soon. Uh, goodbye and have a great day. Thanks again. Thank goodbye. You. Thank you.